Okay, so let's start the class. So last time, so we started talking about styles. And one thing I forgot to show you, you see, this is the HR diagram. And you see all the styles here floated on the main sequence. So that's when the stars are burning hydrogen into helium, okay? Then they will leave the main sequence. If it's a star like our sun, it will become a red giant. If it's a super star, it will become a super red giant or super blue giant. But if you have a red dwarf like this, like we, we talked about them last time. So these are very small stars in size. They have a small mass. And they had found a way to always use all the hydrogen available for them inside the old star, not only inside the core. So they will not evolve as a red giant. Okay, once they are done burning hydrogen and it will take billion and billion of years, they will just fade away and become a white dwarf. So they will move from here to there. Our sun will become a red dwarf. And then, uh, not a red dwarf, a red giant. And then you see here, temperature will increase because the core of the sun will be exposed. And then it will uh, go dimmer and then it will cool down and then it will become a black dwarf. So the, the picture I forgot to show you. Okay, remember how we talked about classification of stars? You can see here where the red dwarf are. So remember the, the classes that were introduced by Annie Jump Cannon. Oh boy, a fine girl or guy kissed me. And then they added lovingly, and then they added tenderly. Right? That, that's me making up. But but they they, they did add some letters because they were very, very cool stars. So that's what I want to, to show you. I wanted to show you. Uh, brown dwarf on the HR diagram here. I have found these pictures. This picture here, you see, brown dwarf, just for them. There was two more letters here, L and, and T. Okay, so these are very, very cool star. And it could be even cooler than that. So they added even a letter here called uh, Y. They have another letter here, why? Otherwise, oh boy, a fine girl, guy, kiss me, lovingly, tenderly, tenderly, and then you can say yes. Okay, if you want to remember. So that, that you're going to have red dwarf, brown dwarf, and then you have like sun, sun like stars here. Okay, and then those will be kind of bluish, and that will be blue stars. These are white dwarfs, so these are dead corpses, okay? They are not burning fuel anymore. And these are about to die, super giant stars. So I thought that picture was cool. Okay, so then we move here. Okay, so for the final, since uh, we have more people now, um, remember the final is Monday 22nd, so one week from now. I forgot the time. I think it's in the morning. Not sure. So make sure you don't miss the final. It's going to be in person on paper. You can bring one page, only one page. Okay. You can bring some notes. So it's open notes, just one page. And it's not cumulative. So it's going to cover like what we did just before, age and distance and whatever we're going to do now uh, and later on. Yes. I, I did? Okay, so it's not cumulative. So make sure you don't miss the, the exam. Okay, so for the exam, do remember how can we tell apart brown dwarf from red dwarf, okay? Because sometimes they have about the same size. The red dwarf here is actually a real star. So those stars will burn hydrogen into helium. They can also burn deuterium into helium. However, a brown dwarf here cannot burn hydrogen into helium because it takes too much energy and the temperature is not high enough and the pressure is not high. So those brown dwarfs, okay, which are also called failed star because they start to burn 
deuterium. So it's deuterium into helium, and then they stop and, and they dim away as a black dwarf. So those brown dwarfs can only burn deuterium into, into helium. And I told you because deuterium, fusing deuterium, so deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen, so it has one more neutron. It has one neutron. Hydrogen has no neutron. So hydrogen just has one proton in the nucleus, and deuterium has one proton and one neutron. So it's easier, takes less energy to burn deuterium into hydrogen. So that's why for the atomic bomb, um, not the atomic bomb, the fusion bomb, the hydrogen bomb, they use actually deuterium and tritium. Okay, so then the other way you can tell apart a brown dwarf from Jupiter, for example, in, in the brown dwarf, you're going to find lithium that you don't find in a planet, like a large planet, okay? Because sometimes it can be confusing if it's a planet or if it's a brown dwarf. So brown dwarf, you're going to find lithium because you cannot use it for a, a, a fusion, and you don't find that in hydrogen. If there were lithium, lithium will sink, okay, because it's heavier than hydrogen, or it will be wiped out with uh, the solar wind when the planets were formed. Okay? And of course, in a red dwarf, you don't find lithium because lithium was already used up for fusion. Okay, so I wanted to make sure that you got this right. And then we move to the sun. So our sun is like average star. It's like a G star. It's actually white. It's not really yellow. It's white. All the color mixed together. And you see you have fusion. So here is a very simple way to explain fusion. You have four nuclei. So you see there is no electron because electrons have been stripped out inside the core. It's like a plasma because it's so hot. So four nuclei of hydrogen, okay? Of course, they're gonna repel each other because plus and plus repel each other. But if they are close enough because of the pressure, and the temperature, so that they, they move, they move very fast, and then they get close to each other. You have another force taking over, which is called the strong nuclear force. So that strong nuclear force is what keeping. Uh, it's like a glue. Okay, so inside any nucleus, you have protons and neutrons. Protons should repel each other, but if they are very close to each other, you have a very strong force. It's called the nuclear strong force and it's like a glue okay it's gluing everything inside nuclei okay so they're going to fuse so this is called fusion so when that's going to happen you're going to have um, energy being burnt out energy being produced right so why is that how can we explain that it takes you to einstein very famous equation e equals mc squared What's the meaning of this very simple equation? The meaning is that mass is just frozen energy. Okay, mass is just a form of energy. So when those four nuclei fuse together, okay, it's like they are losing mass, right? They come together, their mass here will be smaller than the total mass here. So that mass will turn out to be pure energy, radiation. This radiation, okay, so that will be photons, will take about 100,000 years to leak out from the core. So fusion happens in the core, and then those photons emitted that has energy, of course, like it's UV has energy, visible light has energy, it will take 100,000 years to reach, to leave the sun, to escape the sun. Okay, so this, this understanding here, all the modern physics about nuclear uh, physics, quantum physics, and the making of the hyd hydrogen bomb, the making of the atomic bomb, was only possible because Einstein came up with this equation, m equals mc squared. Okay? So likewise, if you take, for example, an atom smasher, like the Large Hadron Collider that you have between Switzerland and France, 
So what's the idea? You take protons, okay? You're going to accelerate them, accelerate them. So they're going to go almost at the speed of light. They're going to crack into each other. They're going to destroy each other. So all their mass disappear, okay? So it becomes pure energy. And then out of this energy, it crystallizes again into mass. But this mass is going to be something, something else, right? So that's how they discover the Higgs boson. If you're interested, 2016 was a Nobel Prize that um, it's called the God particle. Okay, that I'm taking attention. But the idea behind fusion is that there is a loss of mass between the what you start with, so four four protons, so nuclei of hydrogen, at what you end up with, which is a nucleus of helium. You can ask some. Usually, people ask students ask me, but um, I don't know if you see here. How come you have two protons here, and all of a sudden you have neutrons? So it's like a quote unquote identity crisis. Those protons they got tired to be protons, and they decide to turn into neutrons. So for that to happen, you need a huge amount of pressure. And you need a huge amount of temperature. So that's what they are trying to do on Earth. Okay. They try to do like the sun, okay, to turn hydrogen into helium. Okay. And doing so, releasing energy without uh, um, without um, byproduct such as carbon dioxide or byproducts such as, you know all the chemicals that are released when you are burning, burning fossil fuel. So they, they, they try to do that. They, they did it, but it's not very efficient. So anyway, each time you have a fusion reaction, some energy is going to be released. Why? Because mass is lost. And the little bit of mass that is lost, you multiply it by a huge number, which is the speed of light, which is 180 thousand miles per second square okay and you get energy so in that case c here is the speed of light it's a big 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 number so that way you can it's like also a conversion factor so you turn mass into energy okay so for example if i take my notebook here it has potential energy into the configuration notebook r okay if i let go that potential energy is turning into kinetic energy so potential energy is lost and the system mass the system earth notebook has lost mass okay so each time energy is released mass is lost but it's so little of course it's very hard to uh, to measure. So anyway, that, that's how energy is released. It's, it's in, of course, it's going to be very simplified. And how can you explain that proton don't want to be protons anymore? They're going to be neutrons. That could be explained with the, what we call the weak nuclear force. But it's another story. Let's stick to astronomy. OK? So likewise, each time potential energy, gravitational potential energy okay, goes down, energy is released. So it could be kinetic energy or heat. So we, we'll get back to that. So if you look at the periodic table here, you have all the elements. Everything here on the periodic table has been cooked either inside a star when you have fusion or inside a supernovae. So up to iron, a star is willing to cook everything up to iron because doing so, you see that each time you have a new nucleus, the nucleus will be very tightly bound and energy will be released. So anything in nature likes to be at a lower state of energy. I have even noticed that among students. You know, when I have a, a class, the first day of class, you know, students pick their spot. And when they come back, they always go to the same spot. 
okay? Because it requires less energy, okay? So we all try to turn to a lower state of energy, except some, some students or some people, you know, they like to change all the time. But most people, you know, they, they have some inertia, which is totally um, human. But in nature, it's the same thing, okay? Everything wants to be in the lowest state of energy. So when fusion happens, okay, you go from one nucleus to another, another nucleus, to another nucleus, to another nucleus, to another nucleus, and each time energy is lost up to iron. So our sun, it's going to fuse elements up to carbon and oxygen. If you have bigger stars, like uh, still like our sun, but, but more massive, they can burn up to oxygen and magnesium. But the very, very big stars, they will be able to burn silicon, silicon into iron. When they get to iron, that's the death sentence. Because you cannot burn iron into something heavier because it takes a lot of energy to do that. Okay, By doing so, iron is not going to release energy. You see, it's at the top here. Okay, so it's very stable. Uh, it cannot cannot happen. So when a massive star is trying to burn iron, boom, it's going to be a supernova type 2. And that supernova type 2 is going to be so hot that then you're going to cook everything else. So interestingly, this is, this is called nucleosynthesis, and all the iron that you need, you know, to transport hemoglobin in your blood. All, all these iron were cooked inside a supernova, supernova that happened before our sun. So everything is recycled, right? Uh, the magnesium that we need, we need a lot of magnesium. Uh, all those electrolytes that we need to support our electrical system, everything were cooked inside a star or inside a supernova. So that's why Carl Sagan said we are um, we are the dust of stars, which is very cool. So everything else here, okay, you can get on Earth by doing fission. Okay, so it means uranium is able to break apart because it's radioactive, and it will break apart. Why? Because doing so, it's going to release. Um, heavy uh it, it's gonna release uh, elements right it's it's gonna release energy and uranium can be turned into plutonium for example so going up this curve so that will be for the atomic bomb here you have the hydrogen bomb okay so uranium bomb you make uranium break apart and it will be willing to do so because doing so it's gonna release energy okay and then they came up with a hydrogen bomb where you release even more energy, like 100 times more. So that's how it works. Uh, so Carl Sagan said, uh, we are all stardust, star stuff or stardust. Okay. So we talk about red dwarf. You see, this is the greedy stars. Okay, they, they don't like to spend their hydrogen. And inside them, they have what is called convecting, convective motion to make sure that they can, they can grab all the hydrogen available to them and burn that inside their core. So they're going to last forever. But our star, like uh, the sun, what's going to happen? It's going to burn hydrogen inside the core only. So all the hydrogen that you have here, on, when it's on the main sequence, it's not available for fusion. Only the hydrogen here inside the core is available. When you're gonna, you're gonna have fusion inside the core, helium is gonna be the byproduct. So it's like ash, okay? And this helium ash will be dumped inside here. So little by little, you're gonna have helium growing inside the core, but it's not hot enough to burn helium yet. You see here, you have hydrogen burning. So it, it's uh, when it's going to burn out of hydrogen here, it's going to contract 
and the outside will swell up and that's when it's going to become a red giant okay if uh, if you want to write down your name on a piece of paper you can i will give you extra credit i'm always running out of paper so you do that on your own let's see if i have a video for the sun um I, I, I do have, I just need uh, to find it when the sun dies. Then gravity will win the battle with fusion, triggering a chain of events that will destroy the star. Our sun is no exception. Every second, it burns through 600 million tons of the hydrogen fuel in its core. At that rate, the hydrogen will run out in about 7 billion years. As the hydrogen gets used up, it slows down the fusion at the star's core. This gives gravity the edge. With less fusion pushing outward, gravity crushes the star in on itself. But fusion fights back, heating the star's outer layers. When you heat up a gas, it expands. And so the sun will actually expand up. Instead of being a million miles across like it is now, it'll swell up until it's about a hundred million miles across. Our sun will become a red giant. Imagine a sunrise, seven billion AD. It's not just a little yellow disc coming up all cheerful and nice. What you would see is a huge, swollen, bloated red disc slowly reaching up over the horizon. And when the sun is fully up in the sky, it's blasting down heat on the earth. It would be like sticking your head in an oven set to broil. Temperatures here on Earth will reach thousands of degrees. The oceans will boil, the mountains will melt, and we'll have the last nice day on the planet Earth. Then the bloated star will engulf the Earth. But the giant red star is self-destructing. Its core becomes dangerously unstable. With no hydrogen left to fuel it, the star begins burning helium and fusing it into carbon. The star is now destroying itself from the inside out, blasting violent surges of energy from its core to its surface. These energy waves blow away the star's outer layers. Slowly, it disintegrates. The star is dead. All that remains is an intensely hot, dense core. The red giant has become a white dwarf. By the time a star reaches the white dwarf stage, the fusion process has stopped. The engine has finally come to rest. Our sun will end its life as a white dwarf, no larger than the Earth, but a million times denser. A white dwarf is a pretty amazing object. It's incredibly dense. If you could take a sugar cube sized chunk of, of white dwarf and put it on the surface of the Earth, it would be so dense it would fall right through the ground. 
at the heart of a white dwarf, astronomers believe there's a giant crystal of pure carbon. A cosmic diamond, thousands of miles across. The idea that the sun will become this sort of cool, dark lump of cinder material is kind of sad. But that really might. But stars can create something much more precious than a massive diamond. We still have to worry, and we don't have to wait 5 billion years, like in a million years from now, or even 500,000 years. Okay, it's going to be hot, so the sun will still swell up a little bit. It will become larger. And all the ocean on Earth will uh, turn into vapor. So by, by then, I don't know, Elon Musk has to find a way for us to get out of here or, I don't know, move a little bit further away from the sun. I don't know how, how that could be done. So skipping to slide 20, you see what's going to happen to the sun at the end. Okay, so in the core, it's going to be carbon and oxygen. So that's why they talk about a diamond. You know the song Diamond in the Sky, something like this. Okay, so this is, that will be the core, carbon and oxygen. And the temperature will not be hot enough and the pressure will not be hot enough to go further in the fusion process. Okay, so it will stop there. On the outside here, helium is still burning. And then on the outside here, you have hydrogen burning. And here you have hydrogen that is not burning. So ashes always go in the core. At that point here, uh, gravity is going to win because everything here will be squeezed up to be a white dwarf. The outmost layer here will be burnt out in a planetary nebula. But it's not going to be a supernova. Right? So you can see our sun is going to live happily, almost happily, for 10 billion years on the main sequence. Remember, it's going to be in hydrostatic balance. So you have the gravitational pull that try to squeeze the star. So it increases the, the rate at which you are burning fuel. So you're going to have more heat being produced. So you have an equilibrium between gravity pulling in and this radiation pressure from, from the heat pushing out, right? And at the end, it's going to become a red giant. See, so first, you're gonna, that will be the first stage that we are now burning hydrogen into helium, but only for, from the hydrogen inside the core. The ashes here will go be dumped inside the core, but it's not high enough pressure or temperature to burn it. And now you have the hydrogen burning shell here. Okay, so when it's not hot enough to burn hydrogen, that's when it's going to swell up as a red giant. It's going to leave the main sequence. The core is going to be squeezed, and then you're going to burn. Helium, helium into into oxygen, into carbon, until until it dies. Okay, so you have fusion here to support gravity. So that's how it works, right? So each time you have fusion, the ashes are dumped inside inside the core. So, but it's not hot hot enough to to fuse that. So little by little, you are building a helium-rich core without fusion, and fusion happens on the outside. Say, so I hope it's clear. So at the end, you're going to have a red giant. So that's going to be, here you have the sun, the size of the sun, how it is now. Here you have the earth. You see here, the sun is about 100 times the size of the earth. And, and then it will become that big. So that would be very bad for us. Okay, but with technology evolving all the time, maybe we'll find a way to get 
out of here. So at the end, you see, it's going to burn helium into carbon and oxygen. So that will be the core. Okay. And gravity is trying to squeeze everything, but you don't have enough pressure or temperature to go further. Okay. So that's what is going to happen for our sun. So at the end, okay, at the end of its life, it will have a core here made of carbon and oxygen, so like a diamond. Helium will still burning, still burning here. Hydrogen here will be burning in this layer, and here there is no fusion. At that point, there will be a rebounce. So that means gravity try to squeeze everything. It's going to bounce out and you have a gentle, gentle burr. Okay. It's called a cosmic burr. Why it's called gentle? Because it's not a supernova. Okay. It's just burping out gently without thermonuclear reaction. And then you will have an exposed core and we call that a white dwarf. Okay, so again, that will be your future white dwarf. And the sun, when it becomes unstable, it will burp out its outmost layer. And that's what we call a planetary nebula. It has nothing to do with planets. Is that uh, because at the time when they were observing those planetary nebula, they thought that they were new planets in, in formation, but they are not. It's just that those... Um, nebulae happen when a star like our sun was dying and burnt out its utmost layer. Okay, so here, if you are interested, you have all the details. It's going to last 10 billion years, so we have about 5 billion years to go. It's going to become a red giant, it's going to swell up. Okay, so that will happen for 1 billion years, it will stay a red giant and then it will become unstable, and then it will burp out its outmost layers. So the burp, is it's not a quick burp, okay? It's a 10,000 years burping event. But 10,000 years is like the blink of an eye for a star, and then at the end it will become a white dwarf, okay? So here you have an exposed core, so the temperature is going to increase, and then little by little, it's going to dim, 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 and it will become a black dwarf, okay? So planetary nebula, I think I have videos. So that will be the leftover, okay? So let's, let's see if we can talk about white dwarf. Okay, it come, it's coming after. Okay, so here you have some pictures of planetary nebula that you can see. And this one here, uh, you can see at the center, you can see the white dwarf left. Okay, so because the white dwarf is still emitting light radiation, it's going to excite the, the atoms here inside that cloud of dust and gas. This atom, when they get excited, the electron comes to a higher level of energy, and then they come back, they're going to burp out light. So it's a, it's one of the most beautiful displays uh, that you can have, that you can see. Here's another example. This is called the ring nebula. It is a planetary nebula. So at the center, you have like the white dwarf left over, and you just have another star that just happened to be here. Here. Oh, I don't know if you remember when you were a kid, a long time ago, spirograph. D did you have that, a spirograph? No? A am I so old? I guess I am so old. But you can still find them, okay? If you don't want to have your kids always on TikTok and uh, like... Uh, always on on the screen. This this was so that's when that's what we had. Okay, we when I was your age, we didn't have TikTok. We didn't have like whatever, what it's called, uh, Instagram, Instagram, or whatever it's called. We we had this, which I think is much better. So that was the TikTok of our time. 
but you can still find them. You can still buy them. It's very cool. If you want to to keep the kids away from from the screen. So this is called a spirograph nebula. Okay, and sometimes it can be bipolar. So this this uh, structure here can happen when you have a binary system. Okay, remember binary system can affect the evolution of stars very close to each other, and one is one is dying before the other. Okay, so it's going to burp out its outmost layer, but, but because there is another star inside, it's going to make like a uh, in in two two direction, two opposite direction. So let's see if I have a movie to show you. Planetary Nebula, okay, I have one movie here. That comes from your book. So you see, it's based on real, real uh, observations, telescopes, data from telescopes. Okay, so that's the Planetary Nebula that you see, and at the center you have the white dwarf. Like it's quite amazing. And then I have another movie to show you when it's when you have a bipolar structure. So you have a binary system to begin with. One star is dying before the other. And if they are close enough, you see there is a transfer of material. And now they are uh, kissing each other. Okay. Everything is inside that red giant. And then, and then you have the planetary, so you have the burp here, the cosmic burp at the, at the very end. Okay. So that's how they think that this structure is formed. So this one is very famous. It's called hourglass nebula. So you have two poles, right? It's burping in one direction and the opposite direction. This one also is very famous. Okay. It looks like an ant. You see, it's like a cosmic burp, but opposite direction. And at the center, you're going to have the white dwarf and maybe the companion that didn't die yet. Okay, so we call that a bipolar explosion. Okay, ooh, this one is beautiful as well. It's called the butterfly. Butterfly. Mariposa. Butterfly. Butterfly nebula. Okay, here is another example. So it's a gentle burp, okay? It's not a supernova. Ooh, beautiful here. Amazing. These are the best um, eyesight that you, you can see in the in the cosmos. Okay, beautiful, beautiful displays. And you have the white dwarf here left behind. Other examples, I don't even know the name. I forgot. So okay. So once that's done, burping out the outmost layer, you have white dwarf. So how can you explain that white dwarf are already dead? Okay, so there is no more fusion. So how come the, the star can still fight against gravity? Because you remember, gravity is like the evil, right? It wants to bring everything together to have a black hole at the very end. So the white dwarf are supported again by what we call electron degeneracy pressure. And we talk about that for brown dwarf. Okay, so that takes you to Heisenberg uh, principle of uncertainty. So it means when you try to squeeze electrons together, okay, they get very mad and very excited. So they go, they're gonna start uh, moving and, and shaking in all direction. And that will be enough to support gravity. Possibly enough. If not, if not, if it's not enough, then then it doesn't end well. You're gonna have a supernova. But otherwise, in the case of our sun, for example, our sun will be able to counterbalance gravity 
because of that electron degeneracy pressure. So it says when you have two electrons, okay, they cannot be at the same place at the same time. They cannot be um, at the same location because that in that case, their uncertainty for uh, momentum increases. So more you try to squeeze electron, more excited they get, right? So they, they become very, very high, hyper. So that's called also the poly exclusion principle. So very weird stuff, okay? It takes you to quantum physics. Okay, so you have different types of white dwarf. If you have a small white dwarf, okay, like smaller than our sun, okay, about 45% the mass of the sun, it cannot burn helium into carbon or oxygen. So it will stop at helium. Okay, stop at helium, burn out in planetary nebula, the outmost layer. What will be left behind is a white dwarf made of helium. If you have a star like our sun, you're going to get to about carbon and oxygen. Not about, you're going to get a diamond. Okay, you're going to get up carbon, oxygen inside the white dwarf. Now, if you go a little bit more massive than our star, okay, our sun, then carbon and oxygen can be burned into neon and magnesium. So you will get a magnesium white dwarf. And then, you have this um, fresh hole here. We talk about that Chandra Sekar limit. You want to make sure that the white dwarf cannot go over 1.4 times the mass of the sun. So typical question on the final, 1.4 times the mass of the sun is the limit for the mass of a white dwarf. Otherwise, you're gonna have a supernova type 1a, Everything is destroyed, okay? Gravity, gravity wins. And we talk about uh, that. It was can I go back to that? That limit here was found by him. Chandra Stekar. Remember, he was very young, I think he was in his 20. At, at the time, you could not fly from India to England, so he he took the boat, okay, long long journey to England. I guess he was uh, bold, um, and and then he was very good at quantum physics, and he was to become a graduate student. Okay, he didn't even have his PhD, and that's uh, that's when he figured this out. Okay, that that uh, fresh hold. He was mocked by his advisor. Eddington, when Eddington was younger, actually he was uh, really good because he's the one who helped Einstein okay, um, to do his experiment with the, the eclipse that was able to show the general relativity. So at the time he was good, I guess when people get older, I don't know, something goes wrong, but he was not very nice. But at the end, he still got the Nobel Prize, so everything has a happy ending here. So Chandra Sekar limit, it's called. Any question? Okay, we get to very interesting thing, okay, almost to black hole. That's the best part of, uh, of uh, cosmology, I guess. So here you just have ideas. So just to give you an idea of the sizes, so you have the size of the Earth, that will be the size of the sun. And you see a white dwarf is about the size, the size of the earth, but with a huge, huge, huge mass. So you take a little spoon of the white dwarf. If you were able to spoon out some white dwarf, it will be like 10 trucks, okay? Squeeze in a small volume. So the density is huge. So it's gonna, uh, generate a huge gravitational pull. Okay, so here is an example. You have Sirius. Remember Sirius, the brightest star in our sky, and it has a companion here, and it's a white dwarf. Okay, so so okay, so what's going to happen? And we already talked about that. What's going to happen when the white dwarf? Okay, so this one that that was a binary system. 
and just happen that this one dies first. So it's going to burp out its layer, okay, and it has a companion. Okay, so you have a white dwarf here and a companion, and they are close enough that when this star is going to die also, it's going to swell up and it's going to cause what we called a, uh, what is it called? The Roche lobe limit here. Okay, so it's going to cross that point. So here, because gravity is so, so, so huge, generated by the white dwarf, it's going to start pulling the material there. So it becomes like a vampire, right? And you have a, a dance a dance of, of death. Okay, so you have uh, here a star that just swells up in a red giant. And here you have a white dwarf. But the pool here is so, so large. So it's going to start to... Uh, suck the material, right? It's called a vampiring star. It's like a mass transfer from the red giant to the white dwarf. <laughs> so when that happens, you have several scenarios. Okay, so you see here, this is your uh, vampire star sucking the material but because you're going to have conservation of angular momentum, it's going to make a disk here. It's going to an accretion disk. And the material is going to spin faster and faster and faster and faster. So when that happens, you have different scenarios. So what, what, what are the scenarios that can happen? First of all, it can happen what I told you before. When you have like some material falling, like this notebook, okay? So here you have gravitational potential energy. All that energy goes into kinetic energy, which is heat. So all that material falling on the white dwarf is going to heat up so much that you have what is called a cataclysmic variable. So that means the, the, the star here is going to brighten very much, right? So it's going to brighten in the sky and you will be able to see it. That will be the first scenario. I will get back to that on Wednesday. Second scenario, when it's falling, okay? You have so much mass falling, you can have a super superficial thermonuclear reaction. So it's like a bomb, but it's not a bomb that destroys. It's just superficial nuclear reaction, superficial bomb, okay? And so also it will brighten by a lot. So that's called a novi, a nova. Or, or it can be so bad, the mass here is going to increase up to 1.4, the mass of the sun. You you reach the Chandra Seca limit and bada boom, you have a runaway thermonuclear explosion and everything is destroyed. And that will be your supernova type 1A.